Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Herndon. I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon about the wave panel, the new shiny wave panel that you've seen in the last two weeks, uh, and trying to dive through as much of its architecture and the code as I can fit in half an hour. So first up, I'm going to briefly talk about the history of where this wave panel, which is called undercurrent, where it comes from and what its design goals were. And hopefully that will explain a little bit about the various surprises that are in it. Uh, most of this talk will be focused on the two main control flows in the client, which is the rendering path and the UI control path. And towards the end, uh, I'll briefly talk about the staged loading, which is one of the fundamental parts of undercurrent and its capabilities for server-side rendering. So where does undercurrent come from? Uh, in the Google Wave client, the Wave panel that's there has been there for, uh, I guess, nearly two years. And uh, one of our most talented and brightest engineers spent 12 to 18 months on uh, general speed optimizations across the entire client, and uh, we achieved phenomenal increases in speed, like beyond an order of an order of magnitude, something like 20 times speed improvement over the course of 12 months. Um, but it was getting clear uh, towards the middle of this year that the architecture of the Google Wave panel uh, was not going to scale to the latency goals that we were aiming for. We're aiming for uh, the time between clicking on a wave and seeing its content to be down to 150 milliseconds, which is near enough to instant as a user perceives it. So one of the, uh, one of the core constraints about the original architecture for the wave panel that you see in the Google Wave client is that the data flow only goes one way. It goes from uh, there's the core data model. On top of that, there's the conversation model. On top of that, we build a presentation model, which is uh, closer to the structure that you see in the UI. And then only after all that is ready, that gets pushed into the page using GWT widgets. And this incurs a lot of upfront cost before you see a wave. And we pulled out every trick that we could think of to get the, uh, the setup cost for that big stack to get that setup cost down to as, as low as we could. Uh, if we continued for another 12 months, we might be able to get it down to 150 milliseconds. But uh, it gets harder and harder as you try and shave those, those last 10, 50 milliseconds off. I think we got around to about 300 to 400 milliseconds on a good day. So there was still a lot of work to go. So we needed a complete rethink uh, of the architecture of how uh, the wave panel worked. And uh, so this engineer, his name's Ruben, he came up with this, desi this design called Undercurrent. And the design doc has been published for a couple of weeks. And the key goals for Undercurrent are reduced latency. So it's optimized for speed. And um, a second major design goal is to reduce memory consumption so that the wave panel can be used on low power devices like mobile devices or low end browsers like IE. Um, so it's not a simple application. It's not written simply. It's written with these two goals as very much core parts of the architecture. So one of the key things that is a little surprising is that we don't use GWT widgets. So uh, many parts of Undercurrent are very different from how a typical GWT application works. So for anyone who's familiar with GWT applications, you should be surprised. Uh, when you see how Undercurrent does a few things. If you haven't used a GWT application, or if you haven't used GWT to build a web application before, don't think that this is how all GWT applications work. The usual GWT application is much simpler to write, but it has much higher overheads and is slower. So as I mentioned before, there's two primary flows that we're concerned about, and they're about moving between the logical model of the conversation and the view of that conversation. And 
by model, I mean the various model objects that uh, you might recall from Alex's uh, talk yesterday morning. Um, there's a conversation model where there's conversation threads, conversation blips, conversations, conversation views, the contents of the blips, so all this stuff. That's what we mean by the conversation model. And when we say the view, usually we're talking about the DOM, but sometimes we just mean any kind of view, any kind of uh, rendering or representation of the model that you want. So the rendering path takes the model and produces views, and the UI control path handles gesture events that occur on those views, like clicks or key presses, and interprets them as control actions, and those come back and uh, mutate the model, which usually triggers another rendering path. The code style is a, it's a mix of model view presenter and model view controller, for anyone familiar with UI patterns. Uh, model view controller, you've probably seen. Model view presenter, maybe not everyone has seen. Uh, we took a bit of both. We weren't particularly concerned with sticking to one pattern. We just wanted to use whatever worked. So at the core of uh, all parts of how undercurrent works is the ability to map between model objects and view objects without any object references. Uh, so this is achieved through mapping through a series of spaces. Um, we map uh, the conversational objects, the model objects, through to a space of long identifiers that are unique across the entire client session. Uh, we then minimize them to short IDs. There are a couple of reasons for doing this minimization. One is just to keep the DOM smaller when we start using these IDs in the DOM. And the second reason is on IE, HTML IDs are not case sensitive. So we need to uniquify these IDs at least, so we may as well minimize them while we're there. And so this means that for every conversational element, there's a short string. Um, in theory, it can just be a number, like one, two, three. From these IDs that correspond to model objects, we then map them to uh, view objects through another space of view IDs. There's a diagram on the next slide which will make all this a bit clearer. But the main point of this mapping is um, that it doesn't involve any uh, object lookups. It's all done through state and through, um, through computable functions. And this has two advantages. One is that we don't hang on to uh, DOM element references, and we try and minimize the use of DOM elements, uh, because the cost of the, uh, the wrappers that expose those elements into the JavaScript universe is actually not that trivial. And the second reason is that it means it helps server-side rendering bootstrap itself, which I'll talk about in the end. So if you can see this picture, it's a kind of abstract picture of some model objects on the left and some view objects on the right. Uh, for the model objects, if you follow the curved lines down to the left, we ascribe the full, uh, the full unique IDs to them, which we build up through conversational IDs, like the wavelet IDs, blip IDs. So these IDs can get quite long, like 30, 40, 50 characters. Um, and they're case sensitive. From these IDs, we, we map them to short IDs. These short IDs are So those IDs correspond to model objects. For a given model object, there might be several view objects that we care about. For example, for a conversational, for a conversation object, uh, the collection of participants is one sort of view object. Uh, its main thread, like the blip area where you see all the content, that's another view object. So one model object can map out to several view objects. And uh, we construct those view IDs just by appending characters to project into a new space. So once we have this model view mapping, on top of that we build uh, rendering. So what do we mean by a rendering? It's in undercurrent, rendering is defined on an abstract level. It doesn't know anything about HTML or DOM or anything. A rendering is just anything uh, that has a structure that can be reduced to the model. So 
the way we build up a rendering is to uh, use the model structure. So given the model structure defined as a grammar, the way you implement a rendering is by implementing each of these model rules. And by implementing, it just means that for a rule like a thread contains many blips, all you have to implement is just a pure function that produces a, a rendering of the left-hand element, so a rendering of a thread, given two things, the model object for it, and the collection of renderings of all the things on the right-hand side. So this enables uh, code that builds up renderings to run top-down or bottom-up. It's very sort of parser-oriented. And it means we can render any part of the model of the model hierarchy. We can just find an object we want to render and invoke the appropriate rule. And if you look in the code, there's a package called client.render, and all the classes in there are about this grammar, the rules, and driving the rules. But it's all done at an abstract level. We haven't hit anything about HTML uh, yet. So you could use this to define a textual rendering, for example. Next. So there's many view objects, and or there's many types that come into play when we talk about a view object. Uh, an example would be a, a blip view. So this, uh, I won't have time to go into the details of what all these types are, but uh, there's only there's three three things I want to point out. One is that we separate. We have this concept of intrinsic view and extrinsic view. What we mean by that is an intrinsic view just knows about primitive state within a view. So for the example of a blip view, the, uh, the image URL of the avatar, the text that goes in the line at the top, uh, the text that goes in the timestamp field, those things are primitive things and they're exposed through uh, this intrinsic view interface. So there's, a, uh, there's a class in Undercurrent called uh, intrinsic blip view, and you can find things in there. Extending this intrinsic view is a view that knows about surrounding structure. And so in this diagram, this is the foo view on the left. And this reveals the structure of other views that are surrounding this view, or its parent view, or its child views. So in the context of a blip, uh, the blip view interface reveals um, the parent thread reveals reply thread views, prior reply conversations. So these, uh, the implementation behind these view interfaces needs to have some more or less global knowledge about all the different views that can collaborate together, whereas the intrinsic views just know they only need to concern themselves with uh, the details of one particular view type. That's the first thing I wanted to point out. The second thing is that there are two implementations of the intrinsic view that we care about in Undercurrent. One's called uh, the DOM implementation view, and the second is this view builder, which we call the UI builder. And I'll talk about what those two different views are in the next two slides. And the last thing I want to point out is that the view objects are written in a flyweight style. Uh, so you can uh, view objects come into existence uh, more or less transiently, they're used briefly, and then they're either thrown away, or if we want, we can start pooling them and reusing these objects. Uh, they're not intended to be held onto permanently, but some parts do. But in general, they're just used briefly. Um, the view objects don't have much intelligence in them. There's one class called full structure. I don't have time to explain why it's called full structure, but uh, all the knowledge about how all the different structures, all the different views, how they all interplay, how they all glue together, it's all in that full structure. So now I'll talk about the two key types of view that make Undercurrent what it is. So the first is uh, UI builders. Anyone who's used GWT before might have seen UI binder. UI builders are very similar to UI binder. But first I want to... Um, I want to show a little demo just to reveal how mature the web is, that the fastest way to build up content on your page is still to produce HTML strings, give them to the browser, and let the browser parse it. That's still, so this is Firefox, 
This is like 10,000 odd uh, paragraphs with some styling in them. Uh, I just built them up using a big HTML string, took uh, two and a half seconds to do the synchronous calls, five seconds waiting for layout. But if you use the DOM API, it's on all browsers, the DOM API is never faster. On Firefox, it's significantly, well, it's noticeably slower. On IE, it is significantly slower. And on Chrome, uh, string building and the DOM API are kind of pretty much on par. So the DOM API is, is finally reaching parity with string building on the fastest browser. So this is where we are with the web today. Uh, I'm not, so this is building up DOM detached as fragments. If you try and build up the DOM while it's attached, I'm not even going to run it on Firefox because it's not going to terminate. Uh, so the way we build up pieces of UI and undercurrent is with string building. And there's a couple of reasons why this is still faster than using the DOM API. Um, and yeah, some of the main reasons is just the, the glue between the JavaScript universe and the C++ universe of the browser. The glue is not very efficient. So anything that avoids using DOM elements and avoids using DOM API avoids all that glue. So the string parsing is still faster than that. So all our UI is built up using uh, HTML strings. We use string closures rather than strings just so that uh, instead of concatenating strings together over and over again, which is an n squared problem, instead we build up little funks that when told will output a string somewhere. So this means we keep building up a linear complexity piece of UI linear, even though it's building up independent strings for the whole thing. So I'll just briefly show an example of a UI builder. So this, this class is called uh, Participants View Builder. It's the UI builder for the uh, participant panel that you see at the top of a conversation. You can see it implements UI builder. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in there for styles, and that's all GWT stuff. Uh, the main thing I want to point out is the UI builder just has one method, which is to output its HTML string. And uh, this here is just outputting HTML strings. These static methods are just helper methods to keep the HTML well formed, but this code here is just spitting out HTML. And before I continue too much further, I just wanted to point out uh, a recent addition to the build file in Wave Protocol. There's a new target now called Wave Harness Hosted. And when you run that, fires up uh, GWT hosted mode with a URL there. When you run it, it runs this test page uh, called the undercurrent test harness, and it's just a wave panel on a page uh, with a fake wave on it. So if anyone wants to help develop uh, features in the wave panel, then this test harness is the best place to do it. And so while that's loading, I will resume the talk. So a UI builder is just an HTML closure. Now to every UI builder, uh, there's another view implementation called a DOM impl. And a DOM impl reveals the HTML that a UI builder produces, and it reveals it using uh, the DOM API. So uh, these two, the DOM impls and the UI builders uh, collaborate quite closely. They both know each other's structure. Um, and the reason we have these two, two different view implementations will become apparent in the next few slides. So I showed you this is the view builder that outputs a bunch of HTML. In particular, there are some parts of the HTML that we care about. Like this particular part here is a component within the view, which is the element to which uh, participant views get attached. That's in the view builder. In the equivalent DOM impl, so here you see this is the DOM impl of the participant panel. It's written in terms of DOM elements. 
And here we see an accessor for that element that was identified in that string building process. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but um, you'll, if you start looking at the DOM impuls and view builders, you'll see this correspondence between accessors in the DOM impul and particularly identified parts in the UI builders. So from these, uh, from these view implementations, from there we can build the renderers. So we distinguish between uh, static renderers that produce views from live renderers that update views. So if you're looking in the code, the uh, main renderer in undercurrent that renders any part of a conversation is called full DOM wave renderer impl. You can take any part of a model push it through this thing and it will produce a view object. As a, as a cooperating sibling of this renderer is its live version and the live renderer maps changes in the conversation to uh, changes in the views by attaching to, to views and updating them. So this is where the two view implementations come in. We use the UI builders in the static renderers to build up renderings because it's the fastest way to do it. And then in the live renderer, we attach onto existing renderings using DOM impulse. So I'll just briefly show what this code looks like. Um, so for example, this is the live conversation view renderer. And you can see all its contents are handling conversation events. Uh, blips being added, threads being added, com uh, participants being added. So it's listening to model events, and in response to them, it's uh, attaching onto existing views and updating them. So when a blip gets added, uh, we find it's containing thread and attach to it with a view and put a new view as a sibling and so on. Oh, uh, the only thing I wanted to point out is that the live views, sorry, the live renderers, everything's done behind these abstract view interfaces, so it's all clean, separable, and testable. All right, so that's uh, the bulk of the talk. That was all about the rendering path. Um, the other part that's where Undercurrent has a unique approach is the UI control path, which is how we handle browser events. And like I mentioned, we don't use GWT widgets. GWT widgets are the usual mechanism for handling events in a GWT application, but GWT widgets are heavyweight, they're expensive, they require linear setup cost. We want a constant time setup cost. So in undercurrent, there's a single browser event listener at the top of the panel, uh, or you can put it at the top of the page if you want. It receives all the browser events that occur in the panel, and uh, there's a registry of event handlers which are based on kinds. I'll just quickly show you what kinds are. So I, this is the test harness. It's now loaded. It's running just a fake in-memory wave. Um, you can interact with it, edit, reply, and do everything. But if we look at the DOM briefly, I'm not sure how well this is going to come out, but uh, let's see where I. So this this HTML tree here, this is for the rendering of that blip that's highlighted, and you can see that it has an attribute on it called kind, and its value is b. And that tells you this piece of UI is a blip. Um, I won't do r. Uh, all all the significant bits of the of the HTML are annotated with these kinds. This thing here that has kind equals s. Uh, this is the participant s panel. Um, the values of these things can be anything. We just keep them short uh, to keep the DOM small. But it means that as you're looking at the DOM, you can see what all of the objects are. And in particular, this is what we use for event dispatch. So there's a top-level event handler. It receives a browser event. It finds the source of the, source of the event, 
traces up the DOM, finding the nearest ancestor with a kind. Uh, it looks for any event handler that any feature might have registered for handling events on that kind, and it dispatches the event that way. Okay, only two more things to talk about. Um, I'm just going to pay lip service to these. Uh, undercurrent uses a staged loading architecture. Um, what this is designed for is so that um, from a completely cold start of visiting uh, visiting the client for the first time where you've got nothing cached, you've never used um, the app before, uh, we were still aiming for 150, 200 odd millisecond startup time. So uh, the code is all uh, structured so that you load, uh, you get a static rendering from the server, um, some minimal JavaScript uh, gets downloaded, which gives you the ability to read it and move around in it, and then uh, JavaScript to start editing, that's all delayed until later, and there's this staged pipeline. The only reason I mention it is because the top level entry point into the undercurrent code uh, is dealing with all these stages, so just so it's not unfamiliar if you see these stages. So lastly, uh, this entire architecture for undercurrent is designed for uh, low latency startup, and the key component that provides low latency is server-side rendering, so that the HTML that has a rendering of the wave could even be on the initial download page before any JavaScript, before the app is even loaded. So this kind of raises the question, how do you render things on the server? So there's two levels to doing server-side rendering. The first one is rendering the contents of individual documents, and the way we do that is um, the editor, which is open source. Um, we just use the plain old editor, but we run it in a server environment um, that fakes out GWT. This is called GWT JVM. Joseph is the best person to ask to if you've got questions about GWT JVM. Um, but basically, the editor runs, does its thing, thinks it's in a GWT application, but this GWT JVM mocks out GWT, saves what happens, and um, it has a, just an in-memory DOM for it. The next level up, which is stitching these documents together into a wave, well, as you saw, undercurrent defines all its renderings just as plain string functions. So there's no magic here. We just run these functions on the server, because it's just Java, and we get wave renderings. So anything on the, if you have a server that runs these things, it only needs to provide a little bit of extra data uh, along with this rendering needs to provide that ID mapping state that you saw at the start that maps between the long model IDs and the short IDs, which you can use to figure out what these view IDs are um, all referring to. Uh, it needs to talk, it needs to uh, inject into rendering metadata what the version of the wave was so the client can connect to that version. Uh, and it needs some extra metadata if you start doing fancy stuff uh, like paging or not rendering all the blips on the server. But the key thing is uh, this server-side rendering is very fast. It's at least twice as fast, if not five, ten times faster than uh, doing this rendering on the client. It's parallelizable out so that you're really only limited by the size of the largest document in the wave. And uh, most importantly, this rendering could even be pre-computed. So you can prepare a rendering while you're indexing waves or responding to changes so that next time a client uh, requests a wave, you can give them the HTML straight away, no processing. Uh, I should mention, there's no server-side rendering hooked up in Wave in a Box yet. It's a key uh, it's a key part for a fast client that anyone wants to get their hands dirty is more than welcome to dive in. We, we're very happy to help you get started for that. So I just want to finish up by saying what Undercurrent currently has and what we plan to have in the near future. So currently, uh, I think in terms of feature parity with the Google Wave client, all the rendering stuff is all the same. Uh, the rich content, all the different reply types, inline, non-inline, prior replies, collapsed content, all that, it's all there, and it's all live. In terms of reading, there's a focus frame. We track red on red state. Um, there's a small patch, which will go in very soon, where once you read waves in, uh, in Wave in a Box, Next time you come back, all that red state is preserved. Uh, collapsing threads and so on. Editing, you can edit, reply, delete. You can continue threads. Continue is grayed out because we don't have a UI for it other than keyboard shortcuts. 
there's an edit toolbar, gadgets now work, so uh, it's definitely got some momentum getting all these features in. The next features that are coming, there's a few small uh, pieces of low-hanging fruit. Anyone who wants to dive in and you know, start working on the wave panel, uh, these are the kinds of things that are perfect to get started with. Um, please come and talk to me if you're interested. Um, the blue reply indicators that you see in the wave panel in Google Wave, you need to get them hooked up with the reply box. Participants, profile cards, typing carrots. There's a bit of polish for IE. These are all great places to get started. Uh, there's some medium features which we may or may not get done before the end of the year, which is uh, to wire up viewport-based rendering of content, which is something that the Google Wave client does, which significantly reduces startup latency. Um, and you know, blip counters, counting how many blips are in threads. And large-scale features which uh, like the engineers uh, in Google like we won't have time to do any of this, but if anyone wants to take on this as a big meaty project, then we can tell you all about how it works in Google Wave to uh, give you ideas on how to get started. Uh, playback, diff on open, and how to write a rendering server for server-side rendering. All right, has anyone got any questions about any part of what I've talked about? I know you've all been bamboozled with uh, plenty of information today. Yeah, question. Exactly, for the set, but um, when you render the blips, mm -hmm. you don't render them as an editor in the first place. So I have to click on edit first. Is that a UI decision, or is it technically slow to make everything content editable, right? Right. So the question is, when we render blips, uh, we don't render them as editable things immediately. Uh, there's there's a combination of efficiency reasons and product reasons. Um, I guess the main one is the efficiency reason, just rendering a blip versus attaching an editor to it. Um, rendering is significantly faster than rendering plus uh, attaching editability. Um, also, from a product standpoint, often like reading is a far more frequent action than editing, so paying the latency cost uh, from your initial download to get the editor code just to view content, uh, it's probably not worth it. It's also, like we do have, in undercurrent, uh, it does have what we call full wave edit mode, which is when you enter edit mode, as you click around blips, you stay in edit mode. Um, this wasn't the way that the Google Wave client originally was, so uh, I guess the code is kind of written with that original mindset, just with how the original product was spec'd. So. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. You said um, attaching an editor uh, extensive. That's, is that the browser backend, which is it, uh, attaching its internal editor, or is, or is it the JavaScript code of Google editor? The Google, like, yeah, the rich text editor. Um, if, like, we could just set all the, uh, we could just set all the, the documents into content editable mode, um, but that wouldn't work too well with the editor. Um, there's two talks tomorrow on the editor that uh, I'll be uh, describing some things about content editable. And yeah, for reasons that will be explained tomorrow, it wouldn't be beneficial to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. OK, no other questions? Oh, one other question. Yeah. Um, in undercurrent, no, we don't. That's true. Yeah, the question was, is the kind attribute standard HTML? And no, it is not. Um, possibly. Like, it works in all browsers right now. And uh, if and when it becomes an issue that um, it's not well formed or anything, then yeah, I'm sure we can fix it up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks, everyone.